Good morning and welcome to uh, this week's edition of Encompass Live. Um, I am your host and presenter today um, for, day, for, day, for today's Encompass Live show. Um, Encompass um, Live is the Nebraska Library. I am Krista Porter, your presenter and um, host for today's show. Encompass Live is the Library Commission's uh, weekly, webinar weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be available for you to watch later at your convenience. Both the live show and the recordings are free, free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. Uh, for any of you not from Nebraska, uh, the, um, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. So we are similar to your state library. We provide services, resources, databases, training, grants to um, all types of libraries in the state. So you'll find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, public, academic, K-12, uh, corrections, museums, archives. Really, our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Uh, we have guest speakers that come on Encompass Live sometimes from all across Nebraska, all across the country, um, even outside of the country sometimes. Uh, and we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff that talk about uh, come on the show and do presentations for us. And today, um, that's what we have. You have me. <laughs> uh, I am both your host and presenter for today's show. Um, and today we are going to be talking about E-Rate. Uh, E-Rate, I am, in addition to being the host of Encompass Live, I am, I am the Library Development Director here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And one of my um, duties is that I am also the State E-Rate Coordinator for Public Libraries. So I handle all of the training and um, resources, um, training and handholding and making sure our public libraries receive their E-Rate funding. Uh, I do uh, full workshops that will come, be coming up later in the fall, uh, dates to be announced, usually sometime October, November. Uh, but I want to do a shorter version of it here um, to give you, as it says in the title, just the basics of E-Rate, E-Rate 101, just the basics for uh, 2025, 2025 being the upcoming year for getting E-Rate. And so this is gonna be hopefully just an hour long, quick overview of all the basics of the E-Rate program. Um, a good for someone who's just looking for a refresher about what the it is and don't doesn't want to sit through the isn't sure about sitting through the full three hour workshops that will be coming up, um, or if you're just someone who doesn't isn't going to be handling E rate or you want um, you just need to show like your board members or city administrators or someone what this is all about. This is a quickie introduction to that that um, doesn't entail all of the de it down all the details about how to do it. Um, if you're just curious about E-Rate and wondering, what is this? What is this all about? I keep seeing these emails and these posts about it. Um, this would be a way to learn about that as well. All right, so there we go. So what is E-Rate? Good question. Um, E-Rate is a federal program. It is was enacted through the Telecommunications Act of 1996. So um, it's been around for a while now. Uh, it is to and I'll, it says, ensure that schools and libraries can obtain high-speed internet access at affordable rates and keep students and library patrons connected to broadband by providing a discount on eligible services and equipment. Now, what does that mean uh, in uh, not FCC terms? Uh, you can get a discount. Schools and libraries can get a discount on their monthly internet costs and any equipment needed to purchase um, to make that internet those internet costs work. Um, your routers, switches, cables, all of those physical things that make the internet work. Um, it is funded through the universal service fee that we all pay. Um, if you look at any of your internet bills or your phone bills, you'll see something that might say universal service fee or USF um, and all those different taxes and things. And both we and our telecommunication providers pay into this pot of money that is then um, used to give our schools and libraries discounts. Um, it is run by the FCC, Federal Communications Commission. They oversee the program, they set all the rules and policies, and they um, created the Universal Service Administrative Company, or USAC, 
which is the not-for-profit responsible for actually running the day-to-day, -day, um, the actual program, um, the forms you fill out, sub, um, providing you with the funding, et cetera. Um, USAC also cover, handles other programs as well for healthcare, for um, low-income people, um, but we're talking about the E-rate program for educational purposes for schools and libraries. And that's the SLD, that's a school and libraries part of um, E-rate. Um, E-rate commitments are made by a funding year. You apply for, um, every year it's an annual process where you apply um, for the upcoming year. Um, all E-rate funding years run from July 1st of a year through June 30th of the next year. So right now in the fall, well right now it's summer, but in um, late summer, fall of 2024, you are applying to receive funding starting next July, July 1st, 2025, and that will go through June 30th, 2026. So you're always looking to the future, to next year. It's not a retroactive thing. It's not getting reimbursed for something I paid last year. When you are applying, you're thinking for next year. Uh, who is eligible to apply? Um, libraries, library systems, schools, and school districts. Um, as I said at the beginning, I am the state E-rate coordinator for public libraries in Nebraska. So I'm going to be speaking from the um, library side of this. Um, uh, our Department of Education here in Nebraska helps our schools apply. So if you need help, if you're a school and you need more detail or something school specific, I would recommend you just reach out to the Department of Education to ask them about that. Um, but both libraries and schools are eligible. Uh, the, real, the rule for libraries is that um, you must be what is eligible for LSTA funds. This is Library Service Technology Act funds from the um, IMLS Institute of Museum and Library Services. So this is federal funds for libraries um, in Nebraska. All legally established public libraries are eligible for those funds. So all legally established public libraries are eligible for, for E-rate. Uh, this also includes now tribal libraries. This is new um, last year, uh, where now also tribal libraries, um, tribal public type libraries are eligible, not college or university um, tribal libraries. Um, ERA is generally not for um, colleges and universities, for public libraries, schools, and schools. Uh, how much of a discount can you get? This is usually the first thing I tell libraries when they're interested in applying for E-rate is find out how much of a discount it's going to be to see if all of this work is going to be worth your time. Uh, there is, it is an, an annual process. There are multiple forms throughout the year that you submit at certain times, uh, but depending on how much of a discount you get, um, could be very you know, worth taking that time. Uh, discounts can be anywhere from 20 to 90% off of your charges and they're calculated based on two criteria here. Um, the FCC had to figure out some way to figure out what were the neediest areas in the country and there's lots of many criteria for judging poverty levels. And they decided to go with the students eligible for the school lunch program, the national school lunch program. This is the free and reduced lunches that the children get in school. So it's a percentage of the K through 12 students in the school district in which your library is located. Now, your public library may serve students, um, kids from multiple school districts, and that's great. But for E-rate purposes, for calculating the discount, you're looking for geographically which school district does your library physically sit in. That's the school district that you look at. Um, and then whether are you are determined are urban or rural as far as uh, census uh, data is concerned. So how do you figure all this out? Where do you get all these numbers? Luckily, here in Nebraska, our Department of Education posts the school lunch data on their website every year. So you can go to that URL. Oh, and I'll mention too, don't try and scribble down all these URLs that I'm putting here that I have in the um, presentation. You will have these slides available to you afterwards when the recording is available, is ready. So um, just you know, take your notes up if you want to about what I'm talking about, but you don't have to try and write down all of these websites. You'll all have access to these afterwards. Um, so the um, yeah, on the Nebraska Department of Education website, you can go there and look up your um, school district. Uh, there's a spreadsheet. You go to the tab that school districts um, as a whole, find your district, and it gives you the num uh, percentage of children that are um, el eligible for the uh, school lunch program. And to be clear, this is number of students that are eligible, not that actually apply. 
there is no personal information uh, um, provided in any of this data or used. So if you worry about privacy issues, um, there are none to worry about. Um, this spreadsheet just says these this num this this is the number of children enrolled in the school district. This is the number of them that are eligible for the program, and here's that um, percentage. Um, it does not actually report, even in this spreadsheet, how many of those children apply at all. Uh, but once you have that number, then you see if you are urban or rural. Most libraries in Nebraska are rural, of course. Uh, uh, once you cross that 25,000 uh, population, then you become urban, and we only have a few places in the state that are that. And then you use USAC's discount matrix to determine your discount, and here that is. So you can see here, and we'll get into this category one and category two, the types of services that are available in um, the next slide. But you can see here, just having 50% of the students eligible for the school lunch program in your district, you can get an 80% discount on your uh, anything eligible for E-rate. So that's pretty big. Um, 80% off of your bills, that could be a huge help. So, so that is how you figure out your discount. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so what is e-rateable? What are those things that you can get a discount on? Um, every year, the FCC publishes what they call their Eligible Services List, ESL, and the list not sure if the list for 25 is up right now, but it's all they're posted on their website, the current year one and all their previous ones. And it is divided into two categories of service, category one and category two. Category one is the service providing the internet, high-speed internet to your building. And category two is all the equipment that is needed inside the building, throughout the building to make that internet work. So uh, you can see here in this graphic that I put together on the side, um, all these bricks here that's supposed to indicate indicates the walls of the library. So your internet service comes from outside, from wherever, however it comes, that's category one. And then inside the building, all of the equipment, modem, routers, servers, wireless access points, switches, cables, um, all, all sorts of things, all that that makes the internet work inside the building. Those are the things that you can get an E-rate discount on. Um, the things that access the, uh, internet, your PCs, laptops, printers, wireless printers, if you have them, phones, those are not eligible. So it's not the devices, devices are not eligible, it's the service. So in E-rate, we're talking about the internet service, that is what um, anything related to the service itself. So the service coming to the building and then inside the building, all that equipment that you need. Um, for category one, there's no limit on how much funding you can receive. It just depends on how much your internet cost is. For category two, there is a budget for all of this equipment here, and I'm going to explain that when I get um, more into the um, category two services. So category one is basically anything that provides high-speed broadband internet to your library, um, any sort of um, service. So uh, cable modem, DSL, Ethernet, fiber, um, satellite, uh, wireless service. Now this is wireless as far as getting the internet to the building, um, not the wireless inside the building. That's that's different. That's your wireless access points. It's category two. Um, so and this is not an this is not an exhaustive list. This is just some of the most common ones um, in that eligible services list that the FCC posted. It lists all the different types of internet service, but it's basically anything that is internet and can, can come to your building. Uh, to expand a little bit on that, um, if you don't have fiber yet to your building, there is a special construction um, service uh, that you can get a discount on. Uh, this is um, something if you um, need fiber, so this is specifically just for getting fiber run to your building for the very first time. So if you're using some other service for your internet and you want fiber, if it's being, new fiber is finally being run into your, into your community, uh, <clears throat> you can get a discount on the construction costs for getting that fiber to your building. So not just the actual internet service itself, but the cost of doing the construction, um, digging the, um, Trenches, trenches, running the fiber, um, design, planning, project management, anything related to that, you can also get a discount on. Now, I did say the E-rate funding year starts on July 1st, but 
for special construction, you can receive a discount on that work that is done before July 1st, because you do want to have that service ready and going by July 1st. So up until um, any time in the first half of the year, so January 1st forward in a funding year, you can have that construction done during that time and get a discount on that construction for the funding year when the internet starts, service starts on July 1st. Um, E-Ray, the FCC, they understand that you know, the service providers have to do their construction whenever. Um, they can't be in the funding year always. So um, this is something that you would do a planning and timeline with your service provider to make sure they're doing this installation after January 1st, but before July 1st, so that you have your fiber going by the beginning of the funding year. Uh, there is also an additional thing for this estate matching fund uh, program that they added for this to try and help encourage more um, libraries and schools and libraries to get fiber run. Um, this is additional funding from ERH. Um, if your state has will help libraries with some of the costs, E-rate will find an provide an additional 10%. So if your E-rate discount was 50%, it would actually be 60% from E-rate, from the E-rate program, um, because your state has decided to put together, put up money for this. Um, we do have this in Nebraska. It is uh, through the Nebraska Public Service Commission. They actually handle Nebraska's uh, e uh, universal services. Uh, and this is the NUSF 117 is the uh, official designation of this. And it started back in 2020. Um, there's a million dollars that was originally um, set to use over a four year period. That is the original setup, but that it is now an ongoing program. Um, where uh, the Public Service Commission will help libraries cover the cost above what E-rate covers uh, for, and this is just for the special construction of bringing fiber to your library for the first time. So if you're getting that 50% discount of your own, another 10% from E-rate because of this, then Public Service Commission will cover the rest of the cost. Um, that was something they changed in 2023. Um, they modified the original program where they were just covering another 10% and it made it where they will just cover the full amount that is left over after E-rate. Uh, so you can get fiber run to your library at zero cost to you, to the community, Community to, to whoever would pay for this. Um, e rate between E rate and the Nebraska's Public Service Commission, they will both pay your service provider in full for whatever it costs um, to run new fiber to your building. You and your community do not have to do anything, pay anything for it. And this is the URL to go to to look all that and to apply. Um, so here's an example just to you know, people kind of like to see what does this really mean. Um, if there is, um, it costs $100,000 to run fiber to your building and you have a 50% E-rate discount, E-rate does their usual 50, um, half of that, which is 50,000. And then to start with, the library's portrait share is 50,000. But because we have a state matching funding, a state matching fund through the Public Service Commission, E-rate will bump that up um, to 10%, give another 10,000. And then with the change in 2023, the Public Service Commission will cover the rest of that, um, uh, the other 40% of it, um, which is another 40,000, and the library has to pay zero. So $100,000 project, 50,000 from E-rate, another 10,000 from E-rate because we have a state match, and the remaining 40,000 paid by the state. So uh, I highly recommend looking into this. Um, any, you do have to go through the E-rate process. Uh, you submit your four, and we're gonna go through the de this quick details of this as well. You submit a 470 in the fall, uh, find a provider to do this um, for you, and then you sub uh, report that. Uh, then you submit the um, application to the Public Service Commission saying we're, um, we have a provider who will do this for us. We'd like to apply for some of your Public Service Commission state matching funds. The deadline to do this if um, is December 31st, so the end of the year before the year you're gonna be getting the fiber installed. Um, so uh, now would be the time to look at this to see about um, applying. Uh, sometime in the beginning of 2025, usually January, January, February at the latest, the Public Service Commission will let you know if you're receiving the funding, and then you you sent a letter that you will then submit when you do the second step in the E-rate process, letting E-rate know that, ESEC know that you have been approved, um, you have a service provider to do the fiber 
to install the fiber and you have public service commission funding to help out with that and then e-rate knows that they will bump up that 10 percent and how that's all going to work so if you don't have fiber yet in your library look into this if you need to know more about it reach out to me and i can help you do all these applications all right anybody have any questions so far um, before i jump on to the next thing on my uh slides any questions about the e-rate program what you can apply for um we will be getting into category two in just a minute here you can type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface and I can answer any questions you have. Or just whenever you think of them, go ahead and uh, type in a question. I've got the box open and I will uh, answer your question. And so. All right. All right. So there's something new this year as of the uh, 2025 funding year. Just um, let's see, what did you say? Last week, the FCC has added um, Wi Fi hotspots and wireless internet services off site as being eligible for e rate um, discounts. So, if you were, remember or were part of the emergency connectivity fund, if you applied for that, that was um, funding that due to COVID, um, the COVID 19 pandemic, and everyone working from home and going to school from home, um, there was a special fund of a pot of money that was set aside separate from the e-rate program for schools and libraries to provide help help people have wife have internet in their homes or in their community centers or elsewhere outside of the school and outside of the library um because um as you saw from the original graphic there i had it's about bringing internet into the library but now there is this one um this is now added into the program um, just as of last week, so I have some of the basics of it. I don't know how it's going to look on the actual form. Uh, the first form in the e-rate process, the 470, is not available yet because the USAC is waiting to, for the FCC to make this official. So we'll see what that looks like. But I can tell you um, about what this can be done used for. So this is you could then use e-rate funds to get a discount on purchasing Wi-Fi hotspots hot and then paying for the service for those hotspots. And this is that you could then check out to library patrons to take home and use elsewhere um, outside the library. Um, and then schools also for their students or their school staff to take home or um, elsewhere to have internet service. Uh, the report and order from the FCC does explain some of the details of it. Uh, they do have some funding caps on the services. Um, $15 per month for the internet service itself and $90 for purchasing the Wi-Fi hotspot um, together. Um, and this is a three-year budget that you will have for this. So you have a amount of money that is gonna be budgeted for you to use over a three-year period. Um, you can do it all at once. You can do it throughout the three years, whichever works for you. Um, so the three-year funding cap for both um, monthly internet service, so $15 a month times 36 months, plus the $90 to buy the hotspot is $630. Um, so that's per hotspot per its service. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then for libraries, now this is library specific um, budgets here. Um, for schools, they have different, like I said, I handle this for libraries, so. Um, don't know why, but five point you can you can get funding for up to five point five devices per a thousand square feet. Don't ask me why they came up with five point five, but that's just the math. You just have to do the math to figure out what your budget is. So you've got a funding cap, and you have a certain number of devices. This is going to be based on the size of your library. So um, this is similar to when you're doing other um, e rates. So. For example, if your library is 10,000 square feet and you have a 90% discount rate, you have a budget of $31,500 to use over those whole that whole uh, three-year period. Um, and now this is pre-discount, so you would um, E-rate would cover 90% of that 31,500, and you would re would be responsible for only for the additional 10%. That's if you are at the 90% discount. You just do the math for your own library based on whatever your school or your um, square feet is and what your discount rate is to figure out your library's uh, budget. There um, also is the rule, and this is the same rule they have the Emergency Connectivity Fund, which for libraries sometimes uh, 
makes them nervous, but I, that's why I wanted to clarify here. It is It must be used for educational purposes is the official word. And the definition of educational purposes for libraries is activities that are integral, immediate, and proximate to the provision of library services to library patrons. So any service that a library provides counts as an educational purpose. Um, the FCC is just saying whatever libraries do, it's educational. So uh, as we know, you know, entertainment, you know, people, so, so you do not have to, people who want to check out these hotspots do not have to prove to you and say, well, I'm just using it for schoolwork if you're a library. Um, for schools, it's integral, immediate, and proximate to educating the students. For libraries, it's whatever services you provide, they can use the hotspot for. So whether it's databases, whether it's movies they watch, um, attending programs, whatever they want to use it for, um, anything they do in the library, they can do at home on these hotspots. Um, and then, as usual, because this is providing an internet service, you do need to be in compliance with CIPA, the Children's Internet Protection Act, that I will talk about in a little bit too, in more detail. So this is something new, Wi-Fi hotspots and internet service. Um, it was previously that, sep that special program of the Emergency Connectivity Fund. Now it is an official permanent part of the E-Ray program. So if you have a hotspot, a hotspot service already, uh, you can continue applying for discounts for it now that the, the Emergency Connectivity Fund is shut down. Well, not shut down. It's it's wrapping up. It's it's that money's done and gone. And now you can do if you were if you had started out using that to get those hotspot programs going, you can now use E-rate to continue. Any questions about that? The hotspots or internet service? You can type into the questions section of your interface. All right, so now that's all category one services. So that is bringing the internet service to your library or your, to your patrons. Now on to category two, that's the other type of um, E-rate discount that you can get. And this is what is called your internal connections. Any of the equipment that is needed to make your internet work and basic maintenance of these connections. So if they ever need updating or repair work or anything like that, keeping them working. So the initial cost of buying all this equipment and improvements, upgrades, software, et cetera, et cetera. So this is your wireless access points, cables, firewalls, routers, rats, uh, power supplies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, same thing, this is just a list of some of the most common things. You can look at the eligible services list to see what um, the full list is. Um, and when you're in your E-rate application form, you'll get a full list of the things that you can apply for. Now, if you are unsure of if you need to update any of these things, uh, now, uh, your how is your what are your cables like? What are your routers? <laughs> you know, do you have the most recent one? Uh, we do have a couple of things that um, we have something that can help you out here. Uh, the Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit. This is something that was um, created with an IMLS grant. Uh, designed originally for small rural and tribal libraries who don't have an IT person. Many, most of our libraries here in Nebraska, I would say, do not have um, your own IT, dedicated IT person on staff, and that's very common. Uh, so um, this is free, it's open source. Uh, there's a link to it from our um, E-Rate website. And it's basically, there's a document that you can fill in, you answer questions to figure out what do I have in my library? Do I have, what brands, what versions? And then it gives you um, suggestions for a broadband improvement plan to help you update. Uh, you may be updating your, fi your fiber internet service, you may be getting faster speed, but your equipment, all of these things here, need to be able to handle that speed. If it is older routers, older access points, they can't handle the speed that you're getting in the library if you've increased it. Um, so you do have to update your physical equipment at the same time as you're updating your internet speed. And this can help you do that. Um, also recommend um, Andrew Sherman. Sherm is our IT person here at um, in library development who um, is in charge of helping our libraries do this. He can help you navigate this toolkit. He can also come out and do tech reviews for you, come to your library and or work with you over the phone, however you want to, to, um, you know, tell, have him, you know, show him what you have, see what's in your network closet um, and give you advice and recommendations on what you could um, update, what you could would need to update. 
Now, category one, as I said, it's just you get a discount on whatever you're purchasing. Category two works with the budget. Um, and this is um, similar, similar to uh, the Wi-Fi hotspot budget, uh, but it's its own budget for category two equipment. And um, it's a little different. Um, this one's been around for a while. Um, uh, category two has a five-year budget. So you are a budgeted a certain amount of money, pre-discount money to use over a five-year period. Uh, they are, um, your budget is set at the beginning of the five-year period, and then you can use it throughout those five years. You can use it all in one year if you're doing a big update, an addition to your library and expansion, um, or building a new building, or you can spread it out throughout time. One year update your routers, one year update your switches, whatever you need. Uh, right now, we are in the um, the first of these five-year budgets, which wraps up in 2025. So 2025 is the last year of the current five-year budget cycle. So uh, I would highly recommend taking a look at your Category 2, um, all of this equipment, and see if there's anything you want to update now and use up whatever your budget is, um, because after 2025, you're going to have a new budget for 2026. Um, which is fine. <laughs> um, you can wait till 2026, but if you still have money left over, it doesn't roll over to the new year. You just recalculate again starting in 2026. So try and use up whatever money you can that's already out there. So now is the time. This is your last chance for this five-year budget to look at all of this and see what you want to update before we start with a new one. Um, you can... Um, buy things that are more than what is uh the budget allows for you that's fine you'll just receive a discount up to what your budget says it is so you're not limited on oh my budget says that i only have this much money so that's all i can spend on doing updating my equipment no that's just how much e-rate will discount you you're welcome to spend as much as you need just knowing that only part of it might be covered by e-rate it's going to depend on what um you're buying so how do you calculate your category two budget uh, there is also done based on the total area and square feet of your library. And this is just multiplied by a, what they're, they call their multiplier, $4.50, but there's a minimum budget of $25,000. Um, everyone gets a minimum $25,000. And then if your library is larger um, than what calculates to that $25,000, um, you get whatever the math comes out to. So. A library with less than um, the way the math works, 5,556 square feet, you get 25,000. So if you're at 5,556 square feet or below, you just get 25,000, you're good to go. Um, if you're more than that uh, square feet, you do the math and then that's what your budget would be. Um, if the size of your library changes throughout that five year period, you can change your budget. If you add an expansion on, if you move to a new building that's bigger, um, you just update your information in the E-rate system and in your um, you'll get a replacement budget um, and that will you can be you can fix that. So for example, if you have a library that's 3,500 square feet, 3,500 times four dollars fifty cents is 15,750. but you're below that minimum of the 25,000 so you actually get 25,000. This is pre-discount, to be clear. So what you do then is you multiply that by whatever your discount rate. And for an example, if you're at a 50% discount, you get $12,500 to spend on Category 2 services during that five-year period. So that is how the math would work if um, to calculate this yourself. Um, like I said, if you're below that 5,556, you just get your the 25,000. If you're above that, then do the math and see how much your budget would be. Um, this is kept track of in your E-Ray account online. So um, you doing this calculation is just for you to maybe figure out yourself um, ahead of time just to know. But whenever you log into your account, that I'll show you in just a bit here, you'll see what your budget actually is. And um, as you use it for category two serve, um, equipment, it will deduct it within your account and you can see how much you have left throughout the five year period. Any questions about category one or category two um, services, equipment, um, what you can and can't um, get a discount on what's available? Um, Let's see here. We do have a question. Um, hi, five West spots. Mm 
<laughs> yeah. Um, so your library is, yeah, it's. Okay, my library is 35,000 35, square feet. Um, so if I do my math right, at 5.5 times for every thousand square feet, I could have a boatload of hotspots, probably more than what you had. Um, well, uh, so it'd be 5.5 times um, 35, because it's 35,000. So you could have, I believe it says you round up, so you could have 193 hotspots, if that's as many, yes. Um, that's the, the maximum you could have. If you have that many that people need, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot, but there is also the, how much it costs to purchase a hotspot. And I'm not sure what yours was. Remember that you also only get up to $90 per hotspot to spend. Um, so there's, in addition to having this budget, there is also the cap on each item and then the $15 per month for the service. So that's something you'd have to look into too, how that, um, what your, what it costs to buy a hotspot now. And yeah, yeah, uh, and that's the kicker. I think we paid $80 in the service month of 15. Yeah, it's, uh, that is something that a lot of libraries that unfortunately the people are questioning is those minute limits do not seem to be very realistic. And there has been a lot of um, comments to the FCC that those minimums are, those maximums are, those are, they're too low. Um, maybe the purchasing of the hotspot is fine, um, the $90, but the per month, the cost of the service, people are trying to figure who the heck is paying $15 a month. Nobody knows <laughs> that. So you'll get part of it covered. But hopefully that'll be something. Like I said, this is something they're doing for the first time. Things can always change if they realize that, oh, wait, there's, this is not the right math for it. All right, so one other new thing coming this year is a new pilot program that you may have heard about. Also a cybersecurity pilot program that the FCC is doing um, as part of E-Rate. Um, this was, the decision was made on this one on June 11th. And this is a three-year pilot program. So this is not something that has been added into the, um, E-rate program yet, but you will apply for it using this, your same E-rate uh, system, but it's a test. Um, the FCC has, knows that cybersecurity is a major issue, um, needing firewalls and other you know, monitoring, detection, those kind of things. So they're doing a pilot program. They've allotted $200 million to for schools and libraries to defray the costs of service, cybersecurity related services and equipment. And this is a pilot program to test out the effectiveness of this to see um, if this will become a permanent thing. So in the this year for 2024, if you want to be involved in this pilot program, you will apply and then they will pick some some libraries to be part of it. There's only 200 million available, so we don't know how long how far that will go. But if your library has been doing cyber cybersecurity or is having issues with it, and you want to try and get some um, funding to help cover the costs of that, uh, definitely apply. Now, not everyone's going to get accepted. It's going, you know, they want to get a range of sizes of libraries, communities, some rural, some um, urban, tribal, um, different types of um, schools and libraries involved in it. Uh, so, uh, but all you can do is apply, you know, apply for it. And then at least they'll know how many libraries are interested in this too. Even if they don't pick, you know, they don't have enough money to pick everyone. Uh, they will know that so many libraries do think this is important and do want to get uh, E-rate funding for this. So the process, the, there we go. Uh, there are four general categories. This has its own um, pilot program eligible services list uh, that you can uh, look at. Um, on, and there's the USAC website with all the details about the cybersecurity pilot program there in the bottom. Um, four general areas that you can receive the service and equipment, um, next gen firewalls, endpoint protection, identity protection, authentication. A lot of libraries do that for their databases. Um, monitoring response, so if something does happen. Uh, I highly recommend going and looking at the website and seeing all the details of all the different things that are eligible. This is um, 
something new to me too. Uh, there is a just a flat three-year budget of $45,000 per library for this pre-discount. Um, this is just a three-year pilot program and there will be an application filing window of its own for this. So this is not going um, on the same timeline as it's kind of concurrent to E-rate <laughs> with E-rate. Um, as soon as the 470 is available, you can apply for your regular E-rate. Um, whenever they announce the filing window, which they have not announced yet, you will be able to apply to be part of this pilot program. So you have two separate things you'll be doing possibly with E-rate, your regular E-rate application, and then this if you want to. Um, and it's a new form. They came up with a new form, the Form 484 that you will use to uh, apply to be in this program. So if you're interested in cybersecurity, if you're having issues with that, I highly recommend keep your eyes open. Take a look at that website, look into it, um, prepare for, you know, see what you might need, make sure you have all of your E-rate. Um, anyone who's eligible, any libraries and schools that are eligible for E-rate are eligible to be part of the pilot program. So uh, make sure you have all that ready for you. You do not have to have previously um, applied for E-rate at all, or um, you could be brand new to E-rate and just doing this for the first time, and that is perfectly fine. Uh, so take a look at that and look into this pilot program, and then hopefully in the future we might have these um, firewall, um, this cybersecurity as part of a permanent part of E-rate as well. So lots of new things happening this year in E-rate. Any questions about the cybersecurity program? I don't know very much about it because it is a brand new thing as well. There are um, both for uh, this new thing and the hotspot, um, E-Rate will be doing um, webinars and trainings and updates to keep everyone up to speed on how to do both of these things. So um, take a look at the website to make sure um, when they have a new webinar coming up, explaining how it all works in the process. Um, and whenever they announce whatever that filing window will be, I do not know the dates for that yet. All right. Uh, one other thing you do need to be aware of for E-rate, and I didn't mention it briefly earlier, is you do need to be in compliance with SIPA in order to apply for E-rate, anything related to internet access and internal connections. This is something that is, goes for all federal funding that you may receive, um, E-rate, um, IMLS grants, if it's for providing internet or something related to internet service, you need to be in compliance with SIPA. There's information on the USAC website about that. Um, it requires an internet safety policy. You possibly already have one of those. It says something in one of your policies. Don't do anything illegal on our computers. Don't hack our computers, those kind of things. Um, a technology protection measure, that's the actual filter itself, something that filters um, harmful things from um, harmful items on the internet for minors and have at one point had a, had a public notice or a meeting and hearing basically announcing that you are doing it. That's a one-time thing you have to do. Um, your, your filter and your safety policy you have to maintain. So um, something to definitely be aware of that you do need to be in compliance with that as part of E-rate. And we have something that can help you with that now. Uh, SHRM has uh, started up a program last year offering a DNS filtering solution, solution called DNS Filter to all Nebraska public libraries. Um, it, we will cover the full expense and cost of this service. So um, this is a question we get a lot is like, what filter should I use? How much is it going to cost? How do I get it? And there's lots and lots of resources out there, lots and lots of filters you can use. But we now have a funding here through the Library Commission to cover the full cost of the filter. Um, SHRM will help you install it, implement it. He will monitor it for you. Um, so he will come out to your library and get you all set up with this. We already got some libraries on. Um, and it's also good for cybersecurity for um, anything else just in general. It's, you know, it covers you, it is your, makes you SIPA compliant for E-rate and other federal funding like IMLS grants. Um, but it's just a good thing to do to have um, these kind of um, filters. So there's a website you can go to to find more information about it and reach out to SHRM. Um, if you do want to have DNS filter through the Library Commission at no cost to you. All right, and uh, there is a document retention policy with E-rate. You must keep copies of anything related to your E-rate application for 10 years after the last date of service. Last date of service being the end of a funding year. Um, so that would be um, June 30th of a year. So for the upcoming funding year that you're applying for, 
you need to keep any documentation related to funding your 2025 through June 30th, 2036. Um, this does not have to be piles and piles of paper or binders of things or folders. It can all be electronic. Um, this would be your um, application forms, contracts you get, invoices, um, anything documentation, anything related to the anything you did in 2025. Um, for E-rate. Um, if you have a contract that was signed previously, but it covers 2025, like you have just a recurring contract, that contract you have to keep as well. Um, so just think about anything related to this particular year. Um, E-rate can come, USAC can come along and do an, an uh, what they call an audit if they want to. It doesn't mean you do anything wrong. They do random checks and balances kind of thing, um, but they do require that you keep everything for 10 years uh, related to E-rate. All right, on to our E-rate forms and actually applying. So that's kind of the behind the scenes stuff. Um, there are, um, like, as I said, um, we are going past our time. Uh, sorry about that, we did start pretty late because we had some technical difficulties at the beginning. If you do need to take off, that's okay. I'm gonna finish and go through my entire presentation and everything will be recorded and you can come and watch it um, later. So there are four basic forms in the E-rate program. Um, that you, and uh, three of them, everyone does. And the last one for invoicing, it depends on how you receive your discount. Uh, there um, is also an extra form that you do once, the 498, to, if you are getting a reimbursement after the fact, you use that to provide banking information. All of these forms are available in the E-Rate Productivity Center. This is your one-stop shopping for anything E-Rate related. You go in here to submit your application, to apply for E-Rate, to update them with information, to ask questions, to answer their questions. Um, everything all in um, one spot. Um, we do recommend that you use Chrome or Firefox. Other browsers like Edge or Safari or something else, do not play nice with the E-Rate Productivity Center. Uh, Chrome or Firefox are your best bets. If one doesn't work of these two, also just try the other one. Don't ask me why, sometimes you just gotta swap. Uh, for everyone, every library who is, decides to do E-Rate, um, USAC creates an account for your library, your organization, and then one person has to be identified as the account administrator. Typically, it's your library director, or if you do have an IT person or someone you designate, your assistant director is you're in charge of E-Rate, um, they can be um, the one person in charge. You can have additional users in the system if you want to and decide how um, which activities they can do. Everything with full um, permissions, uh, just looking at things, et cetera. So um, to log into the E-Rate system, you go to the main E-Rate website, usec.org slash E-Rate, E hyphen rate. And uh, this is the main screen when you get there. There are two blue buttons. They both do the same thing. Uh, this over here, if you, as, you're, as you're navigating around the website, this bar at the top always stays around, sticks around, so you can always get to the sign in there. But this is your big go here. So you go through the same thing. Uh, when you log in, it will say, give you these instructions. This is something I always warn people about. Um, it gives these instructions saying, you need to hit continue, do the forgot password, reset, da, da, da. You only have to do that the very first time you use the system. If you've never logged in, it's your first time. After you've done that once, you don't have to do all this again, you just log in. Um, it is confusing and misleading, um, but it does say, the first time you sign in is the only time you have to reset your password. You do not have to reset your password every time you log in. Your password will expire every 90 days or so, and it will notify you when that has happened. So it'll prompt you when you try and use it, say, it'll say, oops, your password's expired, create a new one. So do not reset your password every time. Wait for it to tell you that you need to reset. Um, if you do need to do that, there is a forgot password link. After you hit that continue button, you get where you here where you type in username and password. You give them your username is your email address. So then you can reset it. You get the typical password reset email. Very, you know, you've done this a million times. I've done it on way too many other websites. And then you never have to do that. Don't have to do that. Like I said, only do that the first time. Um, every other time you log in, when you're just if you're continuing to E-rate, you just ignore all that and just click the continue button. Enter your username and password, 
click the box to accept the terms. They do have multi-factor authentication now, so you have to send their your um, you have to request a passcode. Uh, you've probably done this on other um, websites where they send something to your phone or whatnot. Um, you send them, so you do that. You will get an email, so you pop over to your email, look for that code. It's only good for 10 minutes. It will expire. What I do every time I've used this code, I immediately go back to my email and delete this message. You don't want to try and use an old cold, old code because <laughs> you will get an error message. Put in the code, and you are in your E-Rate account in your EPIC system, the E-Rate Productivity Center. Um, they do have here, when you log in, there's the E-Rate Productivity Center and the Emergency Connectivity Fund is still here. Libraries are still wrapping up some of that with, with paperwork. So you will see that box there, but it's not something you can apply for anymore. You will click anywhere here on this gray box to get into your um, account. And so this is your main page, your landing page when you first log in. Um, I'm gonna highlight a few things on here to show you um, some things, so this is just the full page. Um, if you zoom in here in the middle, about the middle, under my entities, there is an entity number. This is an important number to be aware of. It's also sometimes called your build entity number, or BEN. Uh, this is a number that is, number that is assigned to your library. Um, it's kind of like a social security number for a person, it stays with you your whole life, assigned to your library, applies to it signs your library your whole life. People may come and go working at the library, but the library itself will always have that as their um, entity number. Um, very often that is what you will have to, um, when you're calling, contacting USAC about something or when they're contacting you, they will refer to the BEN or the entity number for the organization. Also at the bottom of this page, you can look up any forms you submitted in the system. This goes back to 2016 when we first started using EPIC, the EPIC system. So I get this question a lot. Did I submit my 470? Did I submit this form? What did I do last year? You can look up all of them. Your 471, your 470, 46. Do by look at the funding year, and then you will see what's been in the system. Uh, certified over your look at the status over here. If it's certified, that means it's submitted and they've received it. And complete is when you started working on and you still need to finish possibly. So be aware here at the bottom, all of your E-rate forms are always saved in the system. Um, this relates to that document retention policy. You can print out these forms if you want to, you know, print out, download a PDF version if you want them for your own records, but they are also always all saved here within the system itself. Up here at the top, this is where you can submit all of your E-rate forms. Uh, those four that I showed you earlier, your 470, 471, 486, and then their invoicing forms for how you're gonna receive your funding. So this is where you would go to start any of these forms. The first form in the process is the 470. You open a competitive bidding process. You're looking for someone to provide you with the service. Um, if you're doing something brand new, you may get new providers, but if you have a current contract, you can just continue with your current um, provider if you want to, but you do have to put out a 470 um, to start the process. There are some exceptions to that rule. If you have a multi-year contract, meaning you sign a contract and it has a start date and an end date, uh, then you do not need to do a new 470 for all the years of that contract. You would not want to open a new bidding process and ask for new services, new providers, because you're already in a contract with someone. So during the years of the contract, you do not have to do the 470. You just skip to the 471, which is where you tell USAC, this is who we're with, who we're going with. And you just keep letting them know every year of the contract, yes, we're still with them, yes, we're still with them, yes, we're still with them. When that contract expires, then you need to do a new 470 to possibly get a new contract going. Uh, also, um, E-Rate has a, a way where if you're getting really good internet at a really good price, uh, they want to encourage providers to provide this service and make it as easy as possible. You do not have to do a 470 if you can find a good low cost, high speed um, internet service. So this would be if it costs you $300 or less a month and it gives you at least 100 megabits per second speed. If you meet those two criteria, you get to skip the 470, skip the whole competitive bidding deal, and you just wait and do the 471 saying, here is who we have. They It costs less than 300, and it's at least in its 100 megabits per second. Easy. Um, also something new that started last year, um, internal connections. 
if your pre-discount costs for something in a single funding year for internal connections, as well as wiring and routers and switches and whatnot, is less than 3,600, you don't have to do the 470 either. Either. So if you know you can find a you know your service provider is going to give you new routers or whatever, and it costs less than that um, in a single funding year, you just same thing. You just bump to the 470. Wait till the 471 is available and just say, hey, this is what we're buying this year and we'd like our discount. We wanna use our budget, use our category two budget on it. Um, this is a special thing just for libraries. Um, this is what it looks like just when you first go into your 470. I'm not gonna go through the whole form today. This is just a quick overview of everything. On my longer three hour workshops that I do later in the fall, we will go step by step through the form. After you submit your 470 form, you do get a receipt notification. This is just letting you know, here's what you submitted. You can make corrections to it. And then it gives you what is called your allowable contract date. After you submit a 470, you do have to wait 28 days before you can do your 471. You have to allow for that competitive bidding process to happen, allow service providers to reach out to you minimum of 28 days before you can do your 471. Um, your Receipt notification letter does tell you right there what your allowable contract date is, so you do know that. Uh, what's also great is the system will automatically email you and let you know proactively to your email address when you've reached that date as well. So you, you know, it's good to remember it, but um, also you'll get a little nudge saying, okay, you've reached your allowable contract date now, you can go on and uh, do your 471, your second form. Um, competitive bidding, um, this is something that some people are a little, it's, it's a formal bidding process. Um, you Service providers may reach out to you, you compare the offers you receive, and you select the most cost-effective bid. Uh, it doesn't have to be the cheapest bid, just most cost-effective. Take lots of criteria into account for that. Um, but you do have to, um, this is very important, so why I repeat this, because if you jump ahead and do your 471, your second form in the process, before that 28 days has elapsed, you will be denied your funding because you did not meet the rules. So do you know keep all this mind in mind this timeline. We do have on our website, our ERIT website, a timeline, but you do the 470, you sit back and wait 28 days, and then come back to do the 471, your second form of the process. Um, now, there are some uh, situations that people have asked me about that are um, they're concerned about when it comes to E-rate. Uh, what if you have an existing contract? You currently have a service. Um, you're already with some provider. Is it okay to apply for E-rate or do I have to wait for this contract to expire? Or if I have an ongoing contract where I don't sign something new every year, every few years, is, how, do I, how do I do that? That is perfectly fine. You just do your 470, you wait your 28 days, and then you use whatever your existing contract is as one of your bids. Um, your provider does not have to send you a bid because you already know what it's gonna cost with them, but you do then have to evaluate it compared against any other bids that you might receive. Ideally, hopefully, that bid will become your winning bid and you get to stay with your current co um, company um, when you compare it. Uh, you may not get any um, other bids too. Uh, in many of our small communities, there is just one internet provider and that's all there is to go with and that's fine. You can still get an E-rate discount and start using it by just going through this process, waiting and then saying, okay, we're gonna continue with the same company because they're the one um, that we have a, a bid from. Uh, another situation, what if the city pays for the library's internet? The library doesn't actually pay their own. That's perfectly fine. Your city may pay internet for the entire city, all the different city departments. Um, you can still get E-rate on the library's portion of that internet usage. So you would need to have either statistics that show this much is used by the library, this much internet used by the fire department, this much by city hall, whatever, um, or you can do an estimate. Um, but you only get a discount on the portion of it that the library actually uses. So you can do that if you're not, if the city's paying for it all as part of some bigger bill, you can still get an E-rate discount on the library's portion. And what if you don't get any bids or only one? That's okay too. You don't have to have a competition. <laughs> um, if you just get one bid, you go with it. Um, not a problem. If you didn't receive any bids, you can reach out to companies. For example, if your service provider didn't send you a bid, if you don't have a current contract with them, you might wanna reach out to them after that 28 days and say, hey, we're gonna do E-rate now, can you send me something that confirms what we're gonna be paying for you, paying you? And then you just use that as your uh, winning, quote unquote, bid. 
So after that 28 days, uh, anytime after that 20 days you choose, you can close your bidding process. There's nothing to do to close it. You don't like click, check a button or turn off being able to receive um, con um, bids or anything. You just decide as of this date, we're making our decision. Anything received after that, too late. Um, you evaluate your bids, pick who you're gonna go with, sign a contract if you need to. If you have a, already have a contract, you just go with it. Um, and then you do your 471. That's the second form of the process where you report, let USEC know who you're going with. However, the 471 is only available during the application filing window, um, a certain time period. Your 470, your first form is due, available usually July through whenever, um, months and months. But the 471, you can only submit at a certain time. It's usually between January and March of the next year. So E-rate, you start the process in the fall with your 470 reaching out saying, hey, we want to do this. Starting in January, look for the dates when they announce them. Then you do your second form of the process. Um, 471, you have to do every year. There are not ex there are no exceptions for this one, like the 470. Um, something to be definitely aware of, whatever's on your 471 that you say you're receiving, had to have been asked for on your 470 if you submit a 470. So um, you can't decide, you know, once your 471 comes up, like, oh, wait, we wanted to buy some routers too. I'm just going to put that on here. You've got to have a 470 that says you're asking for routers for category two or asking for switches. So those have to match up. You can communicate with your service provider if you want to on the 471. Um, if they, you know, to let them know what you're going, want to do, um, work on the technical details, figure out what models, make models, whatnot that you are um, needing to update on for your internet. So just a reminder, when to do the 471? After your 28 days, after you have a contract or sign a new contract, and whenever that filing window opens up. Uh, date coming soon. Usually they announce when the, when the filing window will be sometime in December, so very close to when it's um, going to happen, um, but it usually runs somewhere January through March. And as I said earlier, that allowable contract date, I know I keep kind of harping on this, but it's very important. This is one of the common things that people uh, miss do by mistake, jumping the gun and jumping ahead and doing this too soon. You'll get an email letting you know when you've reached that allowable contract date, when you've passed, when you've reached that 28 days and you're allowed to go on to the next step. So keep an eye open for this email before you do any of that second step. Um, you are actually sent an email to you in your email address and it is posted in your um, Epic account as well. Um, after you do your 471, same thing, you get a, a receipt acknowledgement. Um, you can make corrections or changes to your 470 and your 471 if you need to. Um, so when you do get this notification, not, it's not in stone. If you realize, oop, I made a typo, you can always make changes. Um, if it's not past your, your ultimate deadline, you can also um, submit a, just a, a new one too. If you decided, oh wait, I totally, I totally messed up this form, you can just do a whole new one if you want to. After you get the 471, if you submit the 471, then it goes to review. Um, and this is where you just have to wait. Um, po uh, Program Integrity Assurance section of USEC reviews it. This can take months. Um, they may ask you questions. You can you answer them in your Epic account. If you don't know how to answer these questions, if they're weird or confusing, reach out to me. I can help you translate anything that they're asking. After they've completed their review, then you get your funding commitment decision letter. You will get an email with this attached to it and it will let you know if you've been funding, if you've been funded and for how much. You might receive more than one if you've done a category two and a category one, or you've submitted things multiple forms at different times. So keep an eye open for this funding commitment decision letter. It will be a PDF attachment. That will be the actual letter with the, with the, with the details. The email is a form email <laughs> that just says, thank you for submitting. Attached is your um, letter. And then it tells you what your next steps are um, in, the, in the process. But if you open up the PDF letter, then you see how much you receive. This is a multi-page letter. Actually, this is just the first page of it. Um, And you see here, it also has the next steps in the letter. And it does talk about here that the next steps are to uh, 
work with your service provider to make sure, see if you're going to have your bills discounted or get reimbursement afterwards. Um, be sure that you're in compliance with SIPA and do the 486. That's the third form of the process that's very important to do is your form 486 where you accept the funding. Uh, this is where a lot of people, many libraries, lose it in the process. Uh, they get this letter saying, yes, you've been approved, you've been funded, yay. They say, great, we're done, we did this. Well, no, what this really means is you've been approved and the funding is being held for you. You still have to respond to them and say, yes, we accept the funding. And that is the 486. So this is the last form you have to do. Um, you're just notifying them that yes, we have received, we, our service is starting. Yes, we want the funding. Um, you, this is where you note it. You also check off that yes, we are in compliance with SIPA. This is the easiest and quickest form to submit because all the data is already in there. You've entered everything when um, you did all the hard work before with the 470 and the 471 of entering what kind of service you want, what kind of service we're receiving. All you need to do here is basically just check, check, check. Yes, everything automatically prefills from what's in there. But it's where a lot of libraries kind of lose it because they get too excited. Like, hey, we did it. Got to do this. Otherwise, you don't get your funding. Um, there is a deadline for it. It's 120 days after your service start date, July 1st, or whenever you get your funding commitment decision letter, email, whichever is later. Now, you can receive this letter after the funding year has started. So July 1st is the funding year. You may receive your funding commitment decision after the year started, and that's okay. You will still receive your full discount going back to July 1st. You'll just have to get some credit. Um, it does take a lot of time sometimes for USAC to get through all of these. And um, But just don't panic if you haven't gotten it by July 1st. Just keep waiting. Hold on. You'll eventually get it. So if you, But if you do get it before the July 1st, October 29th would be the deadline. If you get it after July 1st, it'll be 120 days after whenever you got it. After you submit your Force 86, you and your service provider are both sent a notification that's been done. And then your service provider knows they can start discounting your bills or that you'll start receiving the service via E-rate. There are two, you have two choices of how you invoice. This is the final step in the E-rate process. Um, we recommend doing what they call the service provider invoice, uh, SPY form. This is where your bills are just automatically discounted by their service provider, and then they apply to E-rate to be reimbursed for what they're discounting you. If you go with this method where your bills just are discounted automatically, you are done with your E-rate forms with the 486. That's the first, you only have to do those first three forms. We highly recommend this because it's much easier on the library. Um, but sometimes, for whatever reason, you may want to pay your bills in full and get reimbursed afterwards. That's the bare form. Then you would, you, the library, would submit the 472 after you've paid your bills. So generally, after the funding year is over, um, so after June 30th of 2025, for example, you would then submit an, a bare form to USAC saying, reimburse me, please, for all of these. Um, you might do this if you're doing things with Category 2 where I've paid the bill and I want to be reimbursed. Um, this also has a 120-day de de deadline after the last service date of June 30th or whenever you did your 486. Uh, reimbursements are direct, um, electronic bank transfers only. They don't mail you a check or anything. So if you do go this route, like I said, we recommend you go with this service provider and just get a discount on your bills. But if you do go with a bear, you do it's a it's direct um, deposit into whatever bank account you indicate. You use the form 498 to let USAC know what that bank account is. Pretty much the same kind of thing as doing um, your direct deposit for your own paycheck. This one form is in a special spot on your, in your Epic account. It's not with all these other forms up here because it's a one-time thing, not a repeated form. You click on the name of your library here when you're on your landing page, and then there's a whole bunch of related actions. You go to related actions, lots of different things you can do, and one of those is going to be to create the 4598. If you don't see this on this list, you've already done it. So you may have done this previously just as a preparation, but um, oops. if you um, do see it, you need to submit your banking information. And now if you want to do this, uh, you do want to do this ahead of time before you're doing a bear. It, does, it can take a few weeks for this to all process through and set up the direct deposit. So plan ahead and get that ready to go in, just in case you decide to do a bear or do need to do the bear form. 
Um, the bear form is now integrated into the Epic system. It was previously a whole separate place. You, you might remember doing it there. Um, but last year, November 2023, everything got um, consol consolidated and it is now finally in the Epic system. And that's what this Epic E-rate invoicing link is for. That gets you to um, anything invoicing related, which is what they call what you're doing when you're getting the funding. Um, and that's how you go to find your bear. You will be notified and the service provider notified when the bear has been processed. You will also, as the entity receiving the E-rate discount, get a quarterly report. Something will be emailed to you detailing whether you have, um, what funding has been, what discount funding has been given to your provider if they did it and then discounted your bills or what's been um, deposited into your bank account. Keep an eye on this report. Make sure that whatever USAC sent to the, your service provider, they discounted you the same amount on your bills, just to, so that's way you can keep up checking on that. And that is the process. Those are all the E-rate forms. Um, 470 to get request your service, 471, tell USAC you've picked someone, 46, yes, I'm getting it, please, please, um, we'd like the money. And then invoicing, I am paying my bills, please give me my money, whether it's discounted bill or reimbursement after paying the bill in full. So that is the um, E-rate process there. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, thank you everyone for sticking around. I do appreciate that very much. So sorry about the delay and the weirdness this morning. <laughs> um, the technical issues. Um, does anybody have any questions about um, E-rate? So that is the basics of how the program works. Um, the discounts, uh, how to, what your discount rate is, what you are eligible to apply for, new things coming, Wi-Fi hotspots and service, cybersecurity uh, pilot project, all the various forms that you submit throughout the year. Does anybody have any questions, anything you wanted to know more about, anything I didn't cover yet? Uh, please do type in your questions section. Um, oh, we do have well worth the effort and delay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura, I appreciate it. <laughs> I hope this was helpful. It is a lot, it is quick. Like I said, this is our quickie overview. Full workshops coming in the fall with step-by-step -step instructions on how to do the forms and hopefully some more details and more information about the um, hotspots and the cybersecurity pilot. But I want to get this information out to you all as soon as I could today. All right. Well, if you don't have any other questions, that's fine. Um, you all know where to contact me if you do want to. Um, I do recommend taking a look at the E-Rate website. They have a lot of good training. Um, they have step-by-step -step videos of doing all these different forms. Um, they will be doing webinars on the Cybersecurity Pilot Project and just ba their own basic online E-Rate training. They do a series of workshops, a series of online webinars. Um, in addition to, there is gonna be some um, in-person training this fall as well. Um, if you want to travel somewhere to do, to do that, you can also do it online through their website. Um, you could also sign up for their E-Rate News Briefs. This is a monthly email that goes out um, with just updates to the system, updates to like deadlines, things are happening. If you wanna keep up on things, that's a good thing. I highly recommend signing up for that. Um, they do have a customer service center that you can call if you have any questions. There's also a contact us link where you can do within your Epic system and just submit a question to them. Um, and this is our E-Rate website, my E-Rate website that I maintain here at the Library Commission, where we have updates and information um, about E-Rate as well. So you can go there for more information. And then of course, my contact information. Call me, email me with any questions you have. As I said, I am the state E-Rate coordinator for our public libraries, and I am here to help you make sure you get your E-Rate, um, and hold your hand through everything you need possibly uh, to make sure you do receive all the funding that you are eligible for. Any other last minute desperate questions before we wrap up our show today? No? 
All right. So let's go to here. All right. So that will wrap it up for today's Encompass Live. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. As I said, the show is recorded. It'll be available here. Um, if you use your search engine of choice and look up Encompass Live, the name of the show, you will um, find our main page here. And these are our upcoming shows. But if you go underneath there, there's a link to the archives. Today's show will be at the top of the list. There'll be a link to the um, recording, which gets posted to our Nebraska Library Commission YouTube channel for our archives, and a link to the slides will be here as well. Should be up and ready for you all by the end of the day tomorrow. I do um, email everyone who attended today's show and register for today's show to let you know that's available, and then we push it out onto our mailing list and to our various social media. We do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. You can see here is a reminder about today's show. Uh, we use the hashtag Encompass Live. We push out on the Library Commission's Twitter account and um, Instagram account as well. So if you like to use any of that social media, give us some likes over there and you will get notified. Uh, you can search our show archives if you want to see if we've done anything on a particular topic. You can do just the most recent 12 months if you want something really current or full show archives if you want to just find if we've done anything. Um, I will give you a, a little warning. Um, I'm going to scroll through. I'm not going to scroll through the whole list, but you'll see this is a very, very long list. This is our full show archives going back to when Encompass Live first premiered in January 2009. So we're on 16 years of the show now, and we have all of our show recordings here. So just do pay attention when you are watching an archive show to the original broadcast date. Um, they all say when they first were brought done. Um, many of the shows will be fine and will stand the test of time, still be good, useful information, and um, that's perfectly fine. You know, that's great, but some things will become old and outdated. Resources may have changed, links may be broken, uh, resources may no longer exist. People will work in different libraries or different organizations than when they presented for us. So just pay attention to that date if you are ever watching any of our old shows. But this is something libraries do. We keep things for historical purposes. And as long as we have somewhere to keep all these shows, which for now is on our YouTube channel, we will always have them available for you. So that wraps it up for today's show. And next week, um, we've got our upcoming shows here. You see I've got some August and even September dates coming up. Uh, keep an eye on here as more dates get filled in. Uh, but next week it is is Pretty Sweet Tech. It is the last Wednesday of the month, and always in the last Wednesday of the month is Pretty Sweet Tech Day. Amanda Sweet, our technology innovation librarian, comes on the show and talks about something techy related. And next week she's going to be talking about I love I love this name Screaming Frog SEO, <laughs> um, a tool to keep websites neat and up to date. So if you are trying to clean up your website, check for broken links, make sure things are all up to date, this is a tool that you might be able to use as well. Um, Amanda uses it, and she's going to show us how to use it on next week's show. So please do sign up for register for that show or any of our other ones coming up. So thank you, everyone, for being with, um, with me today. Um, and hopefully we'll see you on a future episode of Encompass Live. Thank you. Bye-bye.